Patrick Pellucci with SLU Space Camera. I'm here tonight with a special show with our friend, longtime friend, Bob Bourbon from Astronomy Magazine. And we're here tonight to do something fun. Um, there's a near-Earth asteroid that was just discovered a few nights ago. And we decided that we wanted to cover it live because we have the capability of doing it. So when Paul Cox approached me, our engineer, about covering this event, we looked into it further and decided that we could do a good job of it from our Canary Islands Observatory. So with that said, we started to pre-plan it and we found that we could do it at a reasonable time and we went ahead and uh, planned it out. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to give you two views of the asteroid of, that was uh, newly discovered on June 10th over in actually Australia from the Siding Spring Observatory by Rob McNaught, and we hope to have Rob join us tonight on the show to talk about how he actually found this near-Earth asteroid, uh, because actually it kind of slips through the cracks. It's uh, relatively big, and it's pretty close. Um, you know, we, when we talk about distances, 14 moon distances maybe seem like it's pretty far away, but actually that's pretty close. Yeah, when that's, that's scary. About, that's scary. Yeah, so we'll talk more about this. I'm still getting the show uh, ready right now. We're kind of in our pregame phase. If you're on the slew.com homepage right now, you'll see the show actually will be counting down, and the live feeds will flick over. And I'm going to be putting in, in some of the boxes below us on the homepage, a video that we produced from yesterday. We were testing this and tracking it to make sure we could get the images properly. So you'll get an idea of what we're going to be seeing as we see it live. But this is actually a kind of a time lapse pr presentation that's going to be in the box below. I haven't done it yet. I'm still working on that, um, but I'm going to do it shortly. So, you know, Bob, why don't you jump in here and uh, talk more about what we're, what's going on here with this near Earth object and you know how uh, fascinating it is that this happened. That it kind of did slip through the cracks through our net of. Uh, astronomers and space agencies who monitor this stuff. Yeah, a little bit strange, Pat. It, it is a little strange. Uh, this is, uh, it's really worlds in collision, and it's a big change from our thinking uh, just 20, 30, 40 years ago when we thought that we were really isolated. I mean, the word space certainly means that there's room up there. And now it's almost like we're dodging bullets here and there. And uh, we thought things of this size We'd, we'd easily detect more than just a few days before they zoom past us. So this one is a little bit worrisome, that we could see something the size of a city block and not detect right. it until just three days beforehand. And, uh, and we, there's no excuse. It didn't come uh, at us from the direction of the sun, because that blinds us and makes it harder to see. This is coming from almost the opposite direction. So it's... Uh, uh, you know, we'll be talking about it, but this is the kind of thing that can change life on Earth, or at least on sections of Earth. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty scary to think that that if this thing, for some reason, did become into, you know, into the path of the Earth, that we couldn't do nothing about it. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of a scary thing too to think about, and I think that's something we got to talk about as well uh, on the show um, today. Right, right, right. That's a generally uh, a good, slightly frightening topic. But it's not a question of if. You know, it has happened before. It will happen again. And when we look at objects like this that are passing only one-tenth the distance between us and the nearest planet, one-tenth that distance, it shows that, boy, it really will happen again, won't it? Right. I, I know. That's uh, stuff you don't think about. But unfortunately, I, I guess we have no choice. So I'm uh, I'm gonna put up this other video on the home page. If you're seeing this, you may have to refresh your browser. I'm gonna see if it goes in. Hold on one sec, Bob. I gotta. Sure. I'm just gonna give people a little preview. Um, okay. If you do that, while you're I doing that, I'm gonna refresh monitors here too. I'll be back in just a moment. Okay. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Yeah. So. I just, if you are on the slew.com homepage, I just threw in a lower box there below where we're hanging out uh, a little time lapse of the asteroid itself flying down uh, through space. You can see it. It's actually pretty cool. 
and we're going to give you a couple different looks tonight as well, live. And I recommend you also look at the middle box where it says LZ1 Asteroid Simulation. Um, it gives you a good idea of the, the orbit path of this particular event as well as it talks to you about, uh, we, we were provided from our engineer Paul Cox, how we're going to vi visually see this tonight with our scopes. So uh, it should be interesting. Bob, are you back or is that Paul? Oh, Paul's here. Yeah, Paul. Hi. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? Yeah, okay. We've got images going up um, if I concentrate once every minute, all right? So. Okay, cool. I, I went ahead and put your YouTube video re time lapse in. Uh, I thought that was a okay. pretty good okay. look that you did yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I apologize for taking your Mead presentation down, but we'll we'll directly oh, go to the yeah, don't we'll, worry. we'll talk to uh, uh we'll let people know where they, they can see it. Put, put it up <laughs> no we'll put it up on the home page afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, exactly. That's a good uh, idea. listen, just just so you guys know, um because of the cropping on T one, it's not actually showing up yet in okay. those images. But when we do see them, it should be a faint red, green, blue dashed line coming up from the lower left of the image. Okay. And it should be cutting up and across the image, okay? Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. So, uh, Paul, we're on live right now, just so you know. Um, and we are getting set up here. We're counting down. We're at T-minus 10 minutes for the asteroid hunt show that we're producing. Paul, are you able to stay on, or do you have to work to do in the back end? I'll, I'll be here to report any problems, but I'm going to be very focused on what I'm doing. Okay, no problem. Um, so what we're going to do here, guys, tonight is we're going to attempt to track this. And Paul actually was doing some testing last night. And I, if you're just joining us right now, you can see that test, uh, the lower box, the very low uh, bottom of a page on the dot-com site. And you can see you know, the time lapse of this asteroid flying through the sky. So, Bob, why don't we talk more about, as we get ready for this, uh, about 10 minutes before it actually starts up, you know, how, do you know how people go about actually tracking this kind of stuff? I mean, how do you even know how to do it? <laughs> well, there's different methods. One is by taking photographs of the sky or electronic CCD images of the sky over periods of time and then seeing if anything changes. In the old days, they used a, a blink comparator sometimes called a blink microscope, which showed if anything uh, moved in the field of view. And a method not too dissimilar from that is still being used. We'll see when uh, Rob McNaught comes on and the Discover, who we're expecting a little later on tonight to join us. And uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see exactly how he discovered this one. There are some automated uh, discovery methods as well. Uh, that's why this is a little bit odd, because this is five times larger than a football field. This is the size of a city block, quite a bit bigger than the last near-Earth right. object that uh, whizzed in. And uh, as we'll be talking about on the show, it has changed the life of the planet. The reason our planet looks the way it does now is because of these near-Earth objects actually impacting with us. I'd also like to talk about something that happened almost on this date, on June 30th, uh, uh, just a century ago, uh, in 1908, when an object of this size, the last time one actually uh, impacted at least our atmosphere and did uh, widespread destruction, and what would happen if that occurred today. So uh, these are important uh, issues. Is this is this going to raise red flags at all with anyone, uh, any agencies at all, because of uh, this kind of slipping through the cracks, or is this to be expected given how we track these things? Well, people in the business call these uh, low-frequency, high-impact events, sort of the way giant solar storms do. In 1859 and again in 1921, there were major events on the sun that would have destroyed our entire electrical grid to the tune of one to two trillion dollars. Now in between, many decades pass and we don't see events like that and people don't worry about them. So we're talking about low frequency, high impact. And that's just the kind of event that does not get the public's attention because of that low frequency part. The high impact, uh, that does. 
because right. uh, people wonder, whoa, what would happen if... But they still relegate it to uh, such an unlikely possibility that usually government agencies don't move on those kind of things until they happen, unfortunately. Right, right. Well, it's going to be exciting to see. We are going to definitely... Uh, uh, Mr. McNaught has committed to come on, so hopefully we connect tonight for the show so we can get his thoughts because he's not just a – this guy does it basically for a living. I mean, he's, I think he's discovered over 70 or so uh, near-Earth objects, comets, that, asteroids, if, things like that. If, if I may, he's actually um, one of two people who work at the Siding Spring Survey, and the Siding Spring Survey is the Australian arm of the Catalina Sky Survey. So that's why those guys are, are down there doing the work that they do. I think it's part of um, Arizona University. Uh, excellent. And that disembodied voice, that's our own uh, Paul Cox, who is our, our uh, chief engineer. Is that his official title, Pat? Sure. <laughs> I, uh, I answer He's been to promoted tonight. He's, he's been promoted tonight, Paul. <laughs> 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 yes, that's fine. Uh, we can call him that. Uh, I like that title. Um, so anyway, we're down to T-minus 6, and we will start showing you some live shots of the asteroid shortly. Um, we are hoping to have uh, Robert McNaught on tonight so he can t discuss how he tracked this and, and right. how he goes about doing this. That'd be and fun. And we'll talk about asteroids. In fact, I have a piece of an asteroid, and I should actually uh, have it ready to hold in front of the camera. So uh, let me get that. Uh, you know, usually one says, I'm going to collect my thoughts. But here I'm going right. to collect more than my thoughts. I'll be back You're in a moment. You're going to collect an asteroid. Yes. No problem. No problem, Bob. Take your time. Um, so anyway, if you are new to SLU, we actually do these events frequently of all types. We've done the big ones like the annular solar eclipses and the transit of Venus, of course. But when events like this pop up, we definitely try to cover them. Or we do other types of events, maybe on Saturn, maybe on the moon. It just depends. And so if, uh, just keep coming back to the slew.com homepage, and you'll see the next show counting down. That's the best way to keep updated. You could also follow us or you know, uh, circle us in your G+, or follow us on Twitter, or like us on Facebook, those kind of things. We do send out notices that way. And if you are interested, uh, click on that membership link. We are actually having another special promotion tonight that we weren't even planning. Uh, we did this promotion on the transit of Venus. You actually get a free telescope today if you become a yearly or two-year member to SLU. So something to consider. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool scope. And Paul actually produced a 10-minute a video uh, as opposed to the one I was asking. But uh, if you, it, we'll post it back up here on the home page. But you can go to our YouTube channel and find it. It's there. And you can learn more about the telescope itself. But as part of a member of SLU, you actually are helping support this type of programming that we provide free to the public. So please consider it yeah. or any contribution that we have. We have a contribution button. I understand, you know, we know the economies are tough around the world, but any amount is uh, appreciated, so we appreciate it uh, as well. So please consider it. And again, today is the special day for the telescope. I wasn't planning to do it, but hmm. this event came out of nowhere, so we said, well, we might as well since it was so close to the transit. Um, so anyway... Bob, are you back? I haven't looked. I am. I am back. And uh, what we'll do on the show is I'll show you a piece of an asteroid that landed about 500 years ago in um, Arizona. This was one that came into our atmosphere, broke up into a lot of pieces, tons of material. Uh, I'm not sure of what the original size was. I don't know if anybody knows. But uh, uh, we'll talk about the, this, and it's uh, very heavy for its size, uh, it, it is what's left after something like this smashes into Earth, and depending upon the size of it, it can do a little, uh, a little bit of damage on the way. Right. Well, it's interesting. You know, I read art recently an article about they're trying to maybe mine asteroids, or someone is, to get the elements, the minerals and whatever off of them to uh, use for commercial reasons. I thought that was kind of crazy, but maybe that's something that actually an entrepreneur could do. Uh, guys, let me just... Uh, interject here because it will get a bit busy for me. Um, we've got <coughs> two image streams tonight. We've got the uh, high magnification one where the asteroid is actually, we're tracking the asteroid, that's a pinpoint with the star streaking behind. And then we've got our half meter telescope oh, uh, taking some... Oh, I got... Taking some... Robert, uh, Robert McNaught's calling me, so I'm going I'm to I'm answer, okay? Okay. 
Go ahead, Bob. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I was just going to say that. Just I, uh, Robert, up, is that you? In these half meter images on the right. Robert, you there? Of the image. Robert, can you hear me? Guys, go ahead and talk because I'm going to be trying to get Robert on. Okay, uh, go ahead, Paul. Continue. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was only just to say that we've been keeping our eyes open um, on these half okay, meter images. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for for the asteroid to actually appear into the image because we've centered those images tonight between the asteroid's path and Barnard's galaxy, which are, which is on the left of the image. So people on the half meter uh, telescope images need to keep their eyes open. Robert, can you hear me? For a red, green, and blue Hello? line you there? on the right-hand side of the images. That's good. Good. You can, you can hear me okay, Robert? No. Uh, let me see if I can chat him. Hold on. I just heard him a little bit there, Pat. Yeah, we just heard him say hello. You can hear him? We heard him say hello. So, yeah. You hear me, Robert? Do you hear me, Robert? Yes, I can hear you now. Thanks. Okay, great. Let me, um, I got to do a little setup so I can make sure that it doesn't backbeat. Go ahead and talk, Bob, while I'll get Robert set up. Yes, well, what we have now is the discoverer of the this near-Earth object, this asteroid, who discovered it only a few days ago. And uh, a little disconcerting that something this big uh, should not have made itself known until just a few days earlier. So it'll be very interesting to hear exactly the process uh, that uh, uh, Rob McNaught used in uh, finding this. And he's becoming pretty uh, well known now for doing this. So whatever he's doing, he's, uh, he's got it down. He's, he's doing it right. Uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're glad that he's on our side and not on the other side, you know, the alien side that wishes Earth to be destroyed. Because... Uh, oh. we, Bob, uh, can I jump in here really quick? Can you, I'm, I'm just doing a quick sound check as we get started here. I got Robert and not. Um, uh, Robert, can you talk? Please talk for a quick second here. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, yeah, ten. Yeah. We I'm hear him fine. fine. Yes, we hear him just fine, loud and clear. Okay, um, I'm just going to go ahead and get us started up, Robert, since we're all here today. Uh, my name is Patrick Pellucci with Sleuth Space Camera. We're here live to do a live coverage of the asteroid LZ-1 that Robert did not actually discover just a few days ago. So we're, we're privileged to have him on with us tonight here as we look at some live images. I believe the show has probably already started on the home page. Yes, it has. And uh, we have here also Bob Berman, who's a longtime SLU friend, but most notably out of a writer, uh, an astronomer from Astronomy Magazine. And we have Paul Cox with us, who's the chief SLU engineer, I guess is his new title. And uh, <laughs> we're happy to have him on as well. And um, so, yeah, Robert, we really appreciate you taking out some time with us today to talk about your discovery as we look at it live. In fact, we got a live shot of it right now on the homepage of slu.com. If you uh, guys go there, you can see this uh, presentation live. Um, you know, Bob, I don't know if you got any quick questions for Robert as we get started, but I'm sure everyone out there would love to hear how you actually found this asteroid. Yeah, well, that's my question, too. Uh, Rob or Robert, uh, how'd you find it? Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing... Um, uh, survey specifically to find uh, uh, new Earth asteroids and, and new Earth comets. The um, telescope itself is um, 0.5 meter Schmidt. It was, um, it's called the Thaler Schmidt because it was built at the University of Uppsala in Sweden and uh, originally um, designed to go to Mount Stromlo in Canberra but uh, after the uh, uh, city grew and the light pollution became too much. It came up to Siding Spring Observatory in northern New South Wales in 1980. Um, the, uh, it was uh, originally photographic, but the University of Arizona um, got a, a NASA grant to uh, uh, upgrade it um, a 4x4K CCD and uh, um, uh, digitize the uh, Arian deck. Um, they would already got a successfully operating system at the Catalina Sky Survey using a 0.7 meter Schmidt. Um, the smaller Schmidt would give us uh, um, additional latitude coverage and uh, additional longitude coverage as well. So the discovery is made in America, can be followed up um, 
just uh, several hours later from, from Australia. Um, so the, the University of Arizona had developed all the software and basically the hardware up, um, hard upgrade all the um, software installed and it's uh, operated ever since. And uh, was this an automated thing or did you, uh, uh, was the image taken earlier or did you find it in real time? No, it's, um, it's a semi-automated survey. We um, searched down to um, a very low noise level in the images. Uh, four images are taken um, about 15 minutes apart. Um, in between taking those images at the same field in the sky, um, it's doing an adjacent field. So maybe, maybe over the course of an hour, it'll do about uh, 20 adjacent fields. Um, so we get... Uh, uh, four images of each field, about 15 minutes apart, and the software um, extracts out possible moving objects. The human eyes are very good judge at deciding which ones are real and, and which are just noise. Um, so, so far, there's been uh, no surveys had a, a very good automated uh, um, uh, algorithm to pick out the, the faintest objects, and the, the human eyes are able to at the moment, make that judgment better. Uh, now, um, is, is this the largest uh, uh, one that you have found near Earth asteroid? No, actually, it's not. It's not particularly big. Um, it's just happened to be very close. Well, not very, not even very close to the Earth. Um, it, it, it's it's pretty close to the Earth, and it's a reasonable size um, near Earth asteroid. But no, I found I found some up in the several kilometer size before uh, mm -hmm. going back along. And there's uh, probably none that stands left on um, uh, short period elliptical orbits. Yeah, so what you know, we're looking here on the SLU.com homepage. You can see the asteroid actually, uh, Paul is imaging it right now. It's what we're Paul, if you're on, can you explain what we're looking at right now? Yeah, the, the the main image stream the main image stream is updating uh, every sixty seconds. And basically what you're seeing is a lot of little dashed lines. Those are the stars moving in the background. And the asteroid is actually the white dot in the middle of that image. So I'm tracking the asteroid as it moves against the background stars. Um, there's a second um, feed that we've got tonight from the uh, half meter telescope uh, that SLU members use up here in the Canary Islands Observatory. And the, the asteroid tonight is passing uh, apparently very close to Barnard's galaxy. So in those images, you'll see a kind of smudgy uh, area to the left, which is Barnard's galaxy. It's not a particularly bright galaxy, and it's an irregular one. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see a red, green, and blue uh, dashed line, and that's the asteroid, because we're not tracking the asteroid in those images. I hope that makes sense. Yes. And Robert, if I may ask you, do you know what the relative speed is uh, of this uh, uh, asteroid as it's swinging past Earth? In other words, if we were in its path, uh, wh what w it's not meeting us head on, it's meeting us sort of sideways, right? Well, I, unfortunately, I don't know those numbers. The, the numbers I tend to know are ones that are specifically applicable to um, observing the asteroid. It's, you know, it's a punt speed across the sky, but I, I do gather it's got um, um, a relatively high um, apparent speed. Um, it's certainly moving across the sky very rapidly at the moment. Um, well, just, just, to to give you a, just to give you an, just to give you an indication on the um, black and white images we've got, those are 60 second exposures. So you can see how far it's moving in 60 seconds across the background stars. Uh, that's pretty darn fast. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating, Paul, that you're capturing. This is great. And some of the people I know in the chat are asking, you know, what are they looking for specifically? You know, this isn't going to be some big fireball that's shooting through the sky. This is how you know we, we capture and image these type of events. Is what we're doing really right now. Um, this is one option that we're doing. Is uh, what Paul's doing with the star tracking, right, Paul? Yep. 
and I think our viewers and listeners should be aware that uh, not uh, just a few days ago we were watching Venus at its very closest to Earth, about 26 million miles away. This is about one tenth that distance. So you can recall how quickly Venus appeared to cross the face of the Sun. Well, this is ten times closer to us, and so it would not be unreasonable for it to be moving ten times faster as it's uh, crossing the sky, uh, just from perspective, even if no other factors were at work. And uh, indeed, it's moving very quickly across the sky. The reason um, uh, Robert McNaught the discoverer of this near-Earth asteroid. The reason we talk about impact speeds is because, of course, everybody is concerned about what if something like this hit Earth. We all know about the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago and the even worse impact 251 million years ago uh, at the Permian uh, conclusion that great, great dying, as it was uh, called. And, and so people are very aware nowadays, especially with all the science fiction movies. Just one century ago, on June 30th, 1908, we had that Tunguska uh, object that came in, uh, either a uh, comet or a, uh, an asteroid that blew up in the atmosphere. And some of us remember from high school that the uh, kinetic energy, the impact force, varies with the square of speed. So the speed of the object is very, very important as to how much damage it would do. Of course, something like this, 500 meters across, 500 yards, a city block in size uh, would certainly, uh, even if it was on the slow speed of normal, create many H-bombs worth of, uh, of an explosion if it came into the atmosphere. So, so that's the thrill factor, the fear factor uh, concerning this. And uh, I think Robert McNaught, uh, uh, as the discoverer, even though you're used to the, uh, the technical aspects and the dry aspects, you're probably aware of the public's uh, almost morbid fascination with these objects, uh, aren't you? Uh, well, there's been so often I've been misquoted as uh, saying that I was you know, afraid of uh, an object being uh, an impactor and um, I, I'd rather become a bit jaundiced over the years. Mm -hmm. um, although there is, a, there, there is a serious threat and the threat is very much more a long term one rather than um, an object is going to be found just a day or two before it impacts the earth and uh, cause mayhem. Um, of course, that, that may happen. So, so, uh, as time goes on and more discovered, it's more and more likely that uh, any impact will be discovered decades in advance. Uh, th th this particular one um, has no impact um, possibilities in the uh, uh, foreseeable future, although I, as more observations are made over the next two days, predictions are going to be made further into the future, but at the moment there are uh, no possible impacts known with this particular asteroid. Okay, so we could everybody could breathe a good sigh of relief about that, knowing that uh, this one is not the one that has uh, our name on it. Well, one one thing you guys could do if you go in, if you're on the slu.com homepage, in the second box below where we're talking, there's a orbit that's provided by uh, it's a simulation by NASA JPL, and you can see how this thing is tracking around our own solar system. So it's kind of interesting to see it as we're looking at it here live tonight. Slew. Okay. Well, I'm looking at a, a slew half meter right now. Is it, I'm just trying to get a sense of where uh, it's in the shot there. Is it on the right side? I yes. I looked at it. Yes. Is that that line right so there? It's on the right hand side. I'll just take a look at it at the moment. It's, it's about halfway up the image um, on the, on the right-hand side. Um, it, hopefully, it's within the, the portal of the, uh, the event viewer. It, it may be yeah, just outside of that, I'm afraid. No, I, it, it looks like it's in there. Because I'm seeing on the left-hand yeah, side, we've got the galaxy, right? Yeah. And then on the far right, I'm seeing a, the line. It's the line that's the asteroid. Is that correct? There were two small squiggly lines showing on the right-hand side, and that's that's right. the uh, the asteroid moving against the background stars. It's a dashed line, by the way, because those images are being taken through uh, several different filters. Um, so we see a little bit of the line for each filter and exposure that it's 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 being taken. 
Excellent, excellent. And I guess uh, we should all be aware that uh, this is no slouch uh, of an object, that galaxy, either, even though it's not a major, a beautiful spiral galaxy, the kind that takes our breath away. This is a very special object discovered by Edward Bernard, E.E. E. Bernard, uh, a little bit over 100 years ago, and it was found to lie only one 0.6 million light years away. In other words, it's a member of our local group of galaxies. We're, uh, we're in a cluster, a galaxy cluster, that uh, someone unimaginatively named the local group, made up of about 30 galaxies, three of which are the, uh, are the stars, uh, the three spirals, ourselves and the Great Andromeda Galaxy and the Pinwheel Galaxy M33, and all the rest are dwarf irregular galaxies, and this galaxy that we're looking at in the field of view, Bernard's galaxy, uh, is one of those dwarf galaxies, but quite close. It's really uh, after the Magellanic Clouds. It was the next galaxy to have its distance measured, and uh, we, we found out it's very close. It's only uh, uh, made of uh, perhaps 100 million stars, which may sound like a lot, but uh, in our galaxy there's over 100 billion stars. So we're talking about a little dwarf galaxy with uh, less than 1% of the material in our galaxy. So this uh, asteroid is way, way in front of that, uh, passing just one-tenth the distance between us and Venus, the nearest planet. Very exciting to be imaging this live. Uh, gents, I've got, a, I've got a factoid for you. Uh, you want to know how fast things, this thing's going. The relative velocity is 16.99 kilometers per second. Excellent. So we're talking about uh, 10 miles a second. Here in uh, America, of course, where people still think in terms of miles, uh, uh, imagine that. Imagine 10 miles per second. So, uh, and that's, you say, Paul, the relative velocity relative to Earth. So that's pretty that's darn fast. Correct. Yes, it is. Now, now, it's still slower than you know, the, the famous Perseid meteors that we'll see later on this summer. Uh, they they uh, impact our atmosphere at about uh, 38 miles per second, so almost four times faster. Nonetheless, uh, that could uh, do a little bit of damage, couldn't it? So, hey, Robert, I wanted to ask you, uh, were you... Were you surprised that a, an, an asteroid this big slipped through the, the net, I guess? It, you know, we only found it two days before uh, it was getting into close approach to Earth? You know, actually, there's a couple of reasons why not. Firstly, I, I don't uh, see it as, as being particularly big. It's right, but it's not, it's not particularly big. Um, but the other thing is it was actually uh, discovered much earlier than it normally would because uh, I found it almost at my southern limit of the telescope. So I found that as it was coming out of the deep southern sky, um, up over the south pole into the, uh, um, into the, the night sky. Um, well, I, I didn't find it a very close elongation to the sun because um, it had to get above the pole, which uh, our man can't reach. But... Um, uh, I, with this telescope, I couldn't have discovered it uh, a night earlier. That was the first possible night I could have found it. This time round, uh, four, four and a bit years ago, uh, there might have been opportunities for finding it, but they wouldn't have been as good as this current one. I mean, sh should we be worried at all that this, I mean, I don't know, I was thinking about, we didn't know it was even there until two days ago. I mean, is it possible that a, a bigger or something we're not expecting, or we pretty well know in advance when, where these asteroids are as they approach Earth? Um, well, I, I wouldn't personally be worried about it. I, I should certainly um, uh, want, want to be aware of what the issue is and how it should be dealt with. Um, currently, there are plenty of... Um, uh, survey is in the uh, northern sky and you know, there's the possibilities for um, substantially larger ones in the future, be it the, the, uh, an expansion of pan stars or um, the large-scale synoptic telescope. Um, but um, sorry to say in seven weeks time the funding stops for this current um, telescope, the Uppsala Schmitz, and then there will be no telescopes whatsoever operating in the southern hemisphere. Um, representations are being made to the Australian um, uh, Federal Government Minister of Science um, because there are no direct funding, competitive funding sources that we can apply um, uh, apply to uh, to fund the project. 
Um, previously, we funded the Biomassa Grant, uh, which finished last year. Uh, um, that was through the University of Arizona. Um, well, but, um, you know, yes, I mean, uh, yes, I, I hear what you say. That that is a shame, but you can understand it. Uh, that the, you know, funding is uh, funding is a little tight uh, because uh, you know what's more important: looking out for these objects that can smash into earth or subsidizing uh, the tobacco farmers. I, I think uh, we have to keep our uh, priorities straight. And uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. No, we rec we'd rather bail out banks. That's what we'd rather. Do. <laughs> And it should also be mentioned, you know, people, of course, are fearful of these things. Uh, looking back to Tunguska just a, a century ago and these uh, great extinction events, but there's a lot more to it than that. The objects that hit us, uh, this, for example, is a, uh, is a piece of an asteroid that actually landed in uh, South America and Argentina about 500 years ago. Here's another piece of an asteroid that came in about 150 years ago in South Africa. And uh, there is some thinking that perhaps, just perhaps, the amino acids that are the building blocks of life, and perhaps even uh, primitive uh, bacteria, who knows, may be hitched rides on these things. And uh, that panspermia idea, which is that planets may get seeded uh, from space by intergalactic, or interplanetary rather, not intergalactic, uh, wanderers. And perhaps life on Earth did not have to start from scratch. Perhaps uh, with the, at least the building blocks of life uh, can arrive here on uh, bits of comets and asteroids. So there's more and more thinking that the solar system, at least, and perhaps even interstellar uh, travelers, can. Uh, uh, th there's more connectivity than we ever thought. We used to think of our planet as this island Earth, as that was the name of the science fiction movie of the uh, of the 50s. And now we're really seeing uh, the connectedness between things, uh, both for better and for worse. So, Robert, uh, before we let you go, do you have any final thoughts uh, about your discovery? Uh, well, I'm glad it's, uh, I'm glad it's being uh, uh, taken to uh, educate uh, the, uh, the public and students about uh, the issue of near Earth asteroids. Um, um, I, mean, I, I have to accept it is a, a, an unusual event in that this is a very bright um, object. It's been a long time since I've uh, imaged a newly discovered 13th magnitude um, asteroid. Um, be, beyond that, I, I, I would probably caution people not to take um, a, a threats of um, impending uh, doom too seriously unless they come from the, the actual groups that make calculations. That's the uh, um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory's near Earth object group who make these um, uh, predictions and the, the University of Pisa in Italy with the um, collaborators in Spain who, who independently make um, impact calculations. Um, unless they've actually come up with a, a possibility of a, of a collision. Oh, actually, I should add, there are one or two amateur astronomers who can, who can do this as well. It would be remiss not to, to include them. But, uh, um, unless it's been uh, um, you know, peer reviewed by um, people that have put in probably thousands of, or thousands of hours of research to make these calculations. Uh, the software yeah, yeah. to make these calculations. Now, um, now Rob, uh, let me ask you. Uh, uh, before you go, and the connection has not been great for us, but uh, let me ask you, you mentioned before how bright it is. I know this object uh, appears about as bright as the planet Pluto, roughly, uh, that is not an easy object, but you've mentioned that it's, uh, that it's brighter, I think you said it's brighter than you expected. Does that mean for a 500 meter object, it is bright for its size? In other words, it's made of a, uh, a shinier material with a, uh, with a higher albedo than most asteroids? No. Would that be fair no. to say? As far as I'm aware, nobody has done any um, observations to determine its albedo. Um, uh, generally, those sort of observations um, aren't made on the fly. They're normally made for um, uh, known asteroids, and people apply for telescope time to specifically to observe them. It may, it may be somebody has made those observations, but I'm not aware that the albedo was known. So just choosing the default range of albedo is from you know, dark and asphalt to, um, to much lighter. Um, it, it comes out of the order of you know, one to several hundred meters in size. 
it's really just a ballpark figure at the moment. I um, see, I see. All, all you can tell from visual observations is how, how bright it is in the wavelength that you're covering. In, in our case, it's basically unfiltered. So, okay. Rob, no, I, I really appreciate you coming on. We're almost, the show's going to be done in here in about five to ten minutes. Um, I'd love to have you back on on any comment or asteroid events. If you would love, if you would do that, we'd appreciate it. I sure yes, I'd be happy to do that. Bear in mind, I'm an observer rather than uh, an expert in the objects themselves, but you know, I'd be happy to help out. No, and, uh, and next time we will send a young woman to wake you up personally uh, in bed there rather than you having to set the alarm. Oh. <laughs> we got to get you Actually, on I try, oh, go ahead. I tried to have a short nap, but um, I've got a, a live trap for... Um, I, we don't have mice in the office. They're called antikinus. It's... Uh, a small mouse-like object, it's carnivorous, and um, I caught one in the traps. And it, it was rattling in the trap for the two hours. I was trying to catch a nap before this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, thank you for joining us. Anyway, Robert. Yes, thank you so much. No, no problem. Okay, All right, bye -bye. Robert, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Uh, and let me explain to our viewers, now that uh, Rob uh, McNaught is gone, the discoverer of this near-Earth asteroid that, as we speak now, is whizzing past Earth at its closest uh, uh, approach, only 14 times the distance to the moon. That means one-tenth the distance to Venus. What he was saying is that, uh, in answer to my question as to whether it was brighter, in other words, odd, whether it was odd for an asteroid, most asteroids are quite dark. You see, uh, like this piece of... Uh, this, this is not a, uh, really exemplative because it suffered uh, coming through our atmosphere. Most of them are quite dark. And he was talking about uh, perhaps the brightness of asphalt, uh, a parking lot. They're, they're, they're dark objects. However, there are some asteroids like Vesa that are, that are quite shiny, that look like vanilla ice cream. So the question is, why is this one so bright at uh, 13th magnitude? It appears about as bright as the planet Pluto through any telescope, which is certainly not bright, but it's not uh, impossibly dark. And uh, so the issue is, uh, how does its size compare to its brightness? And his answer was, nobody knows. And that the size estimate is based solely on its brightness. We assume it's a dark object, and therefore, to be as bright as it appears, it must be a few hundred meters uh, across, in other words, probably the size of a city block. And beyond that, we don't have any uh, more precise information because, after all, the object was only discovered a few days ago. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's fascinating to me that he, he, that just happened so quickly. I mean, he didn't seem so worried, but I was kind of worried that we didn't know this thing even existed until two days ago, and it's pretty close to Earth. Um, now, Pat, did he say that, that they had caught a carnivorous... Uh, a pest there in a trap, and he was trying to get a nap there at the observatory, and it was uh, yeah, rattling exactly. around in the trap. What what kind of animal yeah. did you say? Did you catch that, Paul? It's 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 like a carnivorous mouse. I, I mean, the, the Aussies <laughs> the, the Aussies do one thing really really well, and that's nasty insects and all sorts of other animals. Yeah. So, uh, okay. yeah. Does that mean that if you get if there's like ten of them, they they it's like piranhas. <laughs> well, you you night. Yeah. well, you'll see, Pat, when you join us for SLU's coverage of the total solar eclipse this November. And when you uh, come and join us, you'll see these, uh, these creatures for yourself. <laughs> well, I would He's love definitely that. not going now. Yeah. I'm going to bring <laughs> a lot of uh, bug off spray and traps. <laughs> yeah. um, hey, before we uh, get off here, we got another five or ten minutes. I extended the show a little bit uh, since we were running up over, so it won't. We got another ten minutes or so. Um, but programming like this is supported by membership, so please consider it. You just click the link on the top of the home page. We actually have a special offer today, today only. We did this on the Transit of Venus, and this event came out of nowhere, so I'm just going to extend it for this event. Uh, we're giving a free telescope away if you become a yearly or two-year member to SLU. So just click the membership link. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, Paul actually did a demo of it on our YouTube channel. So you can go to our YouTube channel, the SLU On Air Video YouTube channel, and you can learn more about the telescope it's, itself. And we'll leave the offer up today. So if you sign up today for SLU, you get that telescope. If you can't afford it or your budgets are tight, please consider it a contribution. It really helps us you know, track these guys all over the world and trying to bring you fascinating looks at space 
We do a lot of this stuff. Um, we do all, all obviously the bigger stuff, but stuff like this or other shows on the planets, galaxies, comets, a lot of stuff that happens on SLU. And you can always come to the homepage to learn more about uh, the next show. So, um, Bob, Pat, I'm going to look Pat, at the... Can I just, no, go ahead, Bob. Pat, can yeah, I just ahead, add to that? Um, the, that promotion isn't just about having uh, that particular free telescope along with your membership, but it's actually controlling the telescopes that I'm using this evening, you know, from your PC at home. That's really the core of what SLU is. It's you being able to control these world-class telescopes, you know, on top of a volcano. I'm, I'm at a world-class observatory site in the Canary Islands at the moment, and you get to control those telescopes and get, and get to see a beautiful, uh, full color, natural color, sharp images of Saturn with ring within ring and spiral yeah. galaxies with their cobalt spiral arms and, uh, and all of that in uh, five minutes because of the patented technology. I want to take this moment to thank the SLU members who have willingly given up their reserved time on the telescope tonight to make this special right. coverage of the near-Earth asteroid visit. We've uh, been privileged to have that discover of the near-Earth asteroid on tonight, Rob McNaught, and, uh, but we want to thank the members who, uh, who yielded the telescope so we could bring you these, uh, these close-up images of it. And, Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, one more thing. Asteroids, if you had a piece of an asteroid, as this is, this is one that actually visited us about 150 years ago, one of the characteristics of asteroids is there's a lot of iron in them. So that if you have a magnet, uh, it'll pull on a magnet very strongly. So if you ever have a piece of an asteroid uh, uh, in your driveway and you wonder if that's a real asteroid or not, the first thing you should do is test it with a magnet and see if it really uh, was a meteorite that came from an asteroid. Many of them do. Most of them do. So, Bob, I'm going to monitor the, the chat, the slew uh, conversation section really quick. If someone has a question for Bob or Paul or myself, please do it. Um, the largest, yeah, you, you, they're asking about the dot, it, exactly. You might want to clarify that what we're seeing here, if you're looking at the asteroid tracking, you can see it, you know, Paul has been imaging this, uh, and we're throwing up the recent images every, like, 30 seconds to 60 seconds. But that dot is actually the asteroid traveling through the night sky, and, and those lines are the stars. That's it. No. That's it. And we've been asked to uh, uh, imaging it in different ways, and that one way is uh, really seeing it every minute, updating it, and it is whizzing. Boy, it's whizzing at 10 miles per second, uh, passing way in front of that galaxy that you see, Barnard's galaxy, one of the nearer galaxies to us, a little dwarf galaxy you wouldn't write home about. It's not a, a particularly beautiful galaxy, and uh, there is, uh, but a galaxies are among the farthest things, and here we have one of the very nearest objects ever to pass near Earth. You know, in the category of the, uh, the top uh, 100 objects that have come closest to us, yet without hitting us. Uh, everybody knows about Apophis, which is another asteroid that is slated to arrive on Friday the 13th of April in uh, 2029. And that's going to come so close, it's going to pass between us and our TV satellites. That's how close that's going to come. Oh, it was past us. And that's going to be bright enough. That's third magnitude, Pat. That'll be bright enough to see easily with the naked eye, and we'll actually see that slowly crossing the sky. And then six years later, it's going to come around again, and nobody knows quite how Earth's gravity will have changed its orbit, but there is a tiny chance, one and a quarter million, not, not, not anything to worry about, uh, that that could actually... Uh, uh, impact us, and that's a asteroid about the same size as this one that we've uh, just discovered now, a few days ago. One of the questions in the chat room was, "When is this thing going to come back?" And I, if you look at the the box in the middle, right below where we're at, talking on the slew.com homepage, there's a. If you watch that little simulation, there's a orbit chart. It'll simulate where it goes. It whips by Earth. I believe it's going to come back in 2016. I thought I read somewhere. You, guys you can actually top of your head? Patch, you can actually go to the JPL Horizons website, and it's their orbital simulator. That's how I made that little simulation. And you can you can go there and you can advance the time by days or weeks or months or years, um, and actually see the position of this and a whole stack of other um, near Earth objects as you, well. You know, of oh God, I'm sorry, Pat. No, I'm done. No, I. Oh, you're done. Sorry. Um, you know, people. I noticed in the chat room a little freaked out that this wasn't discovered 
till two days ago, and I kind of if you talk if you listen to what Robert was saying, McNaught, who discovered this, he mentioned the budget cuts that are happening, yeah. and it looks like a lot of their funding were coming out of NASA, and NASA, of course, is getting its budgets cut. And that's well, been I think the, for a while. The, the important aspect there, Pat, I think, is that this was the only, I understand, uh, survey of its kind in the southern hemisphere. So, I mean, Bob will be able to tell us what proportion of the sky, I don't think it's exactly half, but, um, you know, that there's a large proportion now of the night sky that's just not being surveyed for this. One, kind of one quarter of the sky, one quarter of the sky is not, not, will not be looked at at all. So if the, an object comes from that direction, uh, we won't see it coming. On the other hand, since we don't have any means uh, available to uh, stop any such object, uh, maybe we're better off not knowing. <laughs> That's a good point, Bob. <laughs> and on that Probably cheery so. note. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We've got enough to worry about in our lives. We've got to worry about that. So, uh, uh, yes, you notice that they... Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I just need to point out to people that um, if they're looking at the half-meter telescope images now, I'd actually set up that view uh, so that we would see the asteroid cross over the whole of that field of view in the half an hour show. So it's now not visible in that okay. view. It's actually gone off the top of the image. But okay. we've still got in the, uh, the asteroid tracking uh, view, we've still got the asteroid really nicely centered, still whizzing past all, all of the stars in the background. Wow, that was quick. That's quick. This is a fast moving object. Close it's by fast, and, and 10 miles a second. The combination of those two is, uh, uh, that's pretty fast. I, I want to ask Pat and Paul now, uh, if you heard on the TV or from SLU here, from the Discover, that an object is actually, a huge object is going to hit Earth later today, uh, what would be your reaction? Uh, you'd probably uh, pick up the phone and, and want to be the first to tell your friends, right? Well, I, I'm up at 8,000 feet, so I'll probably get hit before the rest of you. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure about it. I bring this up because in the uh, science fiction movies, the usual uh, reaction that they show people doing is running through the streets in panic. Everybody's running through the <laughs> streets. And I just wondered, like, uh, where are they running to? It would seem that no place would be any better than any other uh, in that situation. Uh, I don't think anybody would run through the streets. I think they would just want to uh, tell their friends, be the first to uh, pick up the phone. I think right. I'd sit under a tree with my family, actually, and just... Uh, Stick together, I think. Mean. Uh, but we don't have to do that today because it's you, I now. Would a, I would do a, a, I would do a live broadcast from a bar, <laughs> 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 like we did for the transit. But well, the show there? actually just. You guys, the show actually clicked over. Uh, we're they're done with the live show on the slew.com homepage. Okay. You can actually see a version of it. We did a a time lapse video on the lower box of the home page, the dot com home page. You can watch a little time last we did from last night as we were testing this event. Um, yo, Bob, uh, Pat, do you have any get, final get, thoughts? Sorry, Pat, on the, on the time lapse, get people to check back to the website tomorrow uh, because I'm going to be imaging this thing all night and it'll be a several hour long um, time, time scale squeezed into another small time lapse tonight. Okay, that'll be cool. Uh, that's awesome. So yeah, that's uh, we'll we'll keep providing you guys with uh, more information. That's about very cool. Itself. Paul, thanks for that for that fabulous work you do. And answer this question: Whenever you speak, what fills the uh, the the uh, the field uh, here is a still image of a blue-eyed person looking through a telescope. Who is that? That is me. That's you. Okay. That is me. I, I'm using. I, I use two laptops for these things. So the the small laptop that I'm in the hangout with doesn't actually have a webcam. Um, I'm using my larger laptop to actually run several PCs um, at the observatory uh, remotely. So, but yep, that is me. And it, it's not an old photograph either. So. That's very cool. Very cool. Yeah, you look like you're freezing your butt off. You're like wrapped up to the. Like an, it gets like an cold up here. That's for sure. Like an Eskimo. So, guys, uh, I guess, I don't know, Bob, you have any final thoughts, but please, uh, guys, if you're on the homepage, at least, consider membership for SLU. It helps support the broadcasts that we produce. Uh, membership has its benefits, I guess you'd say. You get to control telescopes, and, in fact, you get a free telescope today if you sign up for a yearly or two-year membership. And take pictures. Take amazing pictures. Yeah. Amazing awesome. pictures. Share them with your friends. 
uh, interact with a community of space enthusiasts worldwide. As you can see, we uh, our guests that we talk to are all over the world. Um, our Transit of Venus broadcast, we had guys in Norway, the UK, um, in a bar in Michigan, <laughs> in New York, LA. I mean, we were all over the place. So, uh, and that's really the membership. That's what it is. It's all people all over the world enjoying space. So please consider it. And um, Bob, you have any final thoughts before we end the uh, broadcast tonight? No, this was fabulous to watch this asteroid. Uh, thanks to SLU and thanks to Paul's great engineering, watching this asteroid whiz past Earth. We were here for the closest approach. It was only discovered a few days ago, seeing it uh, zoom past at uh, 20 times faster than a high-velocity rifle bullet. And to have the discoverer on as well live, roused from sleep, while a snarling a little animal was rattling around in the uh, in the in the trap that they've just uh, trapped it in, a man I eating mean, mouse, man. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. This. You 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 can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. I gotta see this man eating mouse. Man, we gotta do a hang. I'm gonna get, we gotta get him on hangouts. Right, like okay. you can sh see, show the man eating mouse. I want to see All this right. thing. So, so very good. All right, guys. Uh, it was fun. Let's yes. connect. Uh, the sh next show you'll see is counting down. Is Paul? I hope Paul, you're going to do your how-to show. Is that Saturday night? Uh, how-to solution? Yep. Show? Uh, it, it, it was actually uh, organized for last night, but uh, <laughs> then this visitor from uh, the outer solar system came in and, and decided to put it off. So yeah. Yeah. Come Saturday if you guys night. Are considering membership, it's a good a good time to come back to the SLU homepage. You can check out. Paul's going to give a demo of SLU, how to use it, what people can do. And um, it should be fascinating. He's, he's great at it. So, all right, guys. Well, thanks for coming. Okay. Um, My please pleasure. consider membership. And uh, that's it, guys. I'm going to check out and go get some dinner. <laughs> Good night. Okay. Thanks, to, thanks to all the SLU members out there. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, Good guys. Night. Thank you. It really will happen again, won't it? Right. Yeah, I, I know. That's uh, stuff you don't think about, but unfortunately, I, I guess we have no choice. So I'm, uh, I'm going to put up this other video on the home page. If you're seeing this, you may have to refresh your browser. I'm going to see if it goes in. Hold on one sec, Bob. i got to... Sure. I'm just going to give people a little preview. Um, okay. I, if you do oh, that, while you're I doing you that, on. I'm going to refresh monitors here, too. I'll be back in just a moment. Okay. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah, so I just if you are on the slew.com homepage, I just threw in a lower box there below where we're hanging out uh, a little time lapse of the asteroid itself flying down uh, through space. You could see it. It's actually pretty cool. And we're going to give you a couple different looks tonight as well live. And I recommend you also look at the middle box where it says LZ1 asteroid simulation. Um, it gives you a good idea of the, the orbit path of this particular event, as well as it talks to you about, uh, we, we were provided from our engineer, Paul Cox, how we're going to... Uh, Patrick Pellucci with SLU Space Camera. I'm here tonight with a special show with our friend, longtime friend, Bob Bourbon from Astronomy Magazine. And we're here tonight to do something fun. Um, there's a near-Earth asteroid that was just discovered a few nights ago. And we decided that we wanted to cover it live because we have the capability of doing it. So when Paul Cox approached me, our engineer, about covering this event, we looked into it further and decided that we could do a good job of it from our Canary Islands Observatory. So, with that said, we started to pre-plan it, and we found that we could do it at a reasonable time, and we went ahead and uh, planned it out. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to give you two views of the asteroid of, that was uh, newly discovered on June 10th over in actually Australia from the Siding Spring Observatory by Rob McNaught, and we hope to have Rob join us tonight on the show to talk about how he actually found this near-Earth asteroid. Uh, because actually, it kind of slips through the cracks. It's uh, relatively big, and it's pretty close. Um, you know, we, when we talk about distances, 14 visually see this tonight with our scopes. So uh, it should be interesting. Bob, are you back, or is that Paul? Oh, Paul's here. Yeah, Paul. Hi. 
Hey, buddy, how are you doing? Yeah, okay, we've got images going up um, if I concentrate once every minute, all right? So. Okay, cool. I, I went ahead and put your YouTube video re time lapse in. Uh, I thought that was a okay. pretty good okay. look that you did yesterday. Um, okay. I, I apologize for taking your Mead presentation down, but we'll, we'll directly oh, go to the. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk to. Uh, uh, we'll let people know where they, they can see it. Put, put it up. <laughs> no, we'll put it up on the home page afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, exactly. That's a good uh, idea. Listen, just just so you guys know, um, because of the cropping on T1, it's not actually showing up yet in okay. those images. But when we do see them, it should be a faint red, green, blue dashed line coming up from the lower left of the image. Okay. And it should be cutting up and across the image, okay? Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. So, uh, Paul, we're on live right now, just so you know. Um, and we are getting set up here. We're counting down. We're at T minus 10 minutes for the asteroid hunt show that moon distances maybe seem like it's pretty far away, but actually that's pretty close. Yeah, that's, that's, that's scary. Up. That's scary. Yeah, so we'll talk more about this. I'm still getting the show uh, ready right now. We're kind of in our pregame phase. If you're on the slew.com homepage right now, you'll see the show actually will be counting down, and the live feeds will flick over. And I'm going to be putting in, in some of the boxes below us on the homepage, a video that we produced from yesterday. We were testing this and tracking it to make sure we could get the images properly. So you'll get an idea of what we're going to be seeing as we see it live. But this is actually a kind of a time lapse pr presentation that's going to be in the box below. I haven't done it yet. I'm still working on that, um, but I'm going to do it shortly. So, you know, Bob, why don't you jump in here and uh, talk more about what we're what's going on here with this near Earth object and you know how uh, fascinating it is that this happened. That it kind of did slip through the cracks through our net of. Uh, astronomers and space agencies who monitor this stuff. Yeah, a little bit strange, Pat. It, it is a little strange. Uh, this is, uh, it's really worlds in collision, and it's a big change from our thinking uh, just 20, 30, 40 years ago when we thought that we were really isolated. I mean, the word space certainly means that there's room up there. And now it's almost like we're dodging bullets here and there. And uh, we thought things of this size We'd, we'd easily detect more than just a few days before they zoom past us. So this one is a little bit worrisome, that we could see something the size of a city block and not detect right. it until just three days beforehand. And, uh, and we, there's no excuse. It didn't come uh, at us from the direction of the sun, because that blinds us and makes it harder to see. This is coming from almost the opposite direction. So it's... Uh, uh, you know, we'll be talking about it, but this is the kind of thing that can change life on Earth, or at least on sections of Earth. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty scary to think that that if this thing, for some reason, did become into, you know, into the path of the Earth, that we couldn't do nothing about it. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of a scary thing too to think about, and I think that's something we got to talk about as well uh, on the show um, today. Right, right, right. That's a generally uh, a good, slightly frightening topic. But it's not a question of if. You know, it has happened before. It will happen again. And when we look at objects like this that are passing only one-tenth the distance between us and the nearest planet, one-tenth that distance, it shows that, boy, 